Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part one of the pairwise alignment segment of this course. Pairwise sequence alignment is one of the most fundamental algorithms in bioinformatics, and we're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about this. A lot of the things that we do in biology and bioinformatics, ranging from, for example, understanding how the SARS-CoV-2 virus is moving around the world to reconstructing the history of the hominids, has pairwise sequence alignment at its core. Now, I said that this is one of the most fundamental algorithms in bioinformatics. If you're not familiar with the word algorithm, it might sound a little bit intimidating, but its meaning is actually fairly simple. It's a series of steps for carrying out some process. Um, and so you can actually think of um, something like making cookies in the kitchen as an algorithm. Um, so you might have your recipe for doing this, which is gonna involve taking some inputs like sugar and eggs um, and going through some series of steps that is gonna create your output, which is cookies. An algorithm is typically thought of as like a numerical recipe. So when you learned how to do long division in elementary school, so um, you know effectively allowing you to divide large numbers by one another, you learned an algorithm for doing division and you can apply that to inputs that you're getting to produce some output. The algorithm that we're gonna be focused on over the next couple of weeks is for aligning sequences to one another, which is uh, essential to computing their similarity. Um, but before we, um, before I get too much into that, let's just start at the beginning and we will look at an example that would help to motivate why we care about doing biological sequence alignment. I'll then talk about, um, I'll then define a sequence alignment for you and some other terms that are gonna be important. Um, and then we'll start learning about various different algorithms for uh, carrying out this process. Okay, so I have started up um, a command terminal here. And within that command terminal, I'm just gonna start the IPython environment. Um, now I have a window off screen that I'm copy pasting from. Um, and so you probably won't be able to keep up with everything that I'm typing here. Um, but this content is coming from the Q2 book chapter that is associated with these lectures. Um, and so imagine that we have um, three sequences and I'm gonna call them R1 and R2, um, where R stands for reference and Q1, which will stand for query. And what you want to know is whether Q1 is more similar to R1 or R2. Now, there could be any number of reasons why you want to know this. Um, for example, Q1 might be a gene that you have identified of unknown function, and you want to determine if its function is more likely to be the function similar to the function of R1 or similar to the function of R2. Um, you also might, um, and like what I'm going to work through in this example is where we have a gene sequence from different organisms, and we want to know which, um, uh, which organism's gene sequence this is most similar to, Q1 is most, most similar to. Um, and so what I'm starting with here is um, three hemoglobin sequences. Um, this first one from humans um, is um, what I'm going to call R1. Oops, and I forgot a step there. Um, I forgot to import the scikit bio library, which I'm going to be using here. Um, and so if I say R1 equals skbio.protein, and then I provide this protein sequence, um, I can define a new variable R1 that is of type skbio protein. Um, and so if I just type R1 here, um, scikit-bio will give me some useful information about that sequence that I entered. Um, so for example, you can see that it's of length 142. Um, it's a protein sequence as indicated on that first line there. Um, and then at the bottom, it's just showing us that sequence split over multiple lines and with spaces entered just to um, help us identify um, the different, uh, uh, or basically spaces 
just to visually break up that sequence and um, let us see, for example, that like these are the first 10 amino acids, these are the second 10 amino acids, and so on. Um, okay, I'm gonna type clear, um, which is just going to clear out my terminal. Um, still, it hasn't done anything to that R1 variable. It's just given me a fresh screen to work with. Um, now I'm gonna type, I'm gonna enter R2 and we'll take a quick look at that. Um, this is uh, a hemoglobin sequence from chicken. And so we've now, we now have a hemoglobin sequence from human and a hemoglobin sequence from chicken. I'm going to define this third sequence here, um, which I'm going to call Q1 for our query sequence. Um, I can type Q1, um, and that will just give me that same information about that query sequence. <clears throat> now, if I want to know which of these sequences are most similar to one another, the um, the most straightforward way to do that is to compute what's known as the Hamming distance between any pair of sequ uh, or between these pairs of sequences. Okay, so I am going to uh, import the Hamming function from the SciPy library, and what the Hamming function does is it gives us the fraction of positions that differ when two sequences are provided as input. Um, and so Hamming takes lists or arrays as input. So if I were to provide A, B, C, D, actually I'm gonna do um, this just a little bit in a quicker way. So for example, if I type A, B, C, D, E, um, and I provide that to the function list, that will generate a list for me. And so if I call Hamming on list, you can see that these differ at one position, just at their last position. Um, and so when I can, when I run this, this is going to tell me that 20% um, or 0.2 um, of the uh, positions differ between these two lists. And so you can see that is just one out of the five positions. Um, if I were to change this um, so that they were the same, I would get a Hamming distance of zero. Um, and if I were to make these totally different from one another, I would get a Hamming distance of one between those sequences. <clears throat> And so your Hamming distance is always going to be a value between 0 and 1, inclusive of those boundaries. <clears throat> um, so we can apply this to our sequences. Um, and so <clears throat> remember, if we have like, say, R1 here and we have Q1, um, we can see those two sequences. Um, if we squint at them, we can see that there are some positions that differ between them. Um, so for example, like this fourth position here um, differs between these sequences, but Hamming will allow us to compute very quickly what differs between those sequences. Um, and so I can compute my Hamming distance between R1 and Q1. And that distance is about 17%. And I can compute the Hamming distance between R2 and Q1. And that's going to be about 32%. Um, now, what that tells us is that Q1 is more similar to R1 than it is to R2. Um, so it has a smaller distance, Q1 and R1 have a smaller distance from one another than Q1 and R2 do. And so that means that they are more similar to one another. Um, now I can give you a little bit more information about what this sequence Q1 is. Um, this is a hemoglobin sequence from whale. And so it makes sense that that sequence would be more similar to human than to, uh, than to chicken, because we know that whales, like humans, are mammals, um, and chickens, unlike humans, are not mammals. 
Um, and so what we expect is that organisms that have diverged from uh, their most common ancestor more recently should have more similar genetic or genomic sequences to one another. Um, and so this allows us to make some sort of an assessment about the relationship between these organisms. So if we didn't know going into this that humans and whales were more similar to each other than whales and chickens, this would provide some evidence in support of that um, conclusion. Okay, so I'm gonna take another sequence now, um, and I'm gonna call this sequence Q2. Um, so I'm gonna paste that in there, and there's one thing that I wanna point out that I did slightly differently here. Um, so Q2 is another hemoglobin sequence, but this gene sequence coming from this other organism happens to be one amino acid shorter than Q1, R1, or R2. Um, Hamming distance can only be computed on sequences that are of equal length. And so what I did here was I just stuck an additional character at the end. I just put a dash character at the end. Um, and what that does is it'll make Q1 um, the same length as R1, R2, and Q1. And it'll therefore allow us to compute the Hamming distance. The way that Hamming is going to um, uh, evaluate that is it's going to say that those sequences differ at that last position and so when it tallies that up it's going to count this last position here it's going to count a difference at that position and so um, that makes sense for what we're trying to do here that um, is a it is different in a way um, and so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to compute the hamming distance between r1 and Q2, and then I'm going to compute this between R2 and Q2. Um, so what you can see here, if you compute uh, compare these to the distances that I have above, is these distances are much, much bigger than what we observed before. Now, this sequence, Q2, happens to come from the platypus, um, which, as you know, is also a mammal. Um, but a very anciently diverged mammal from the rest of the mammals, um, with one exception. Um, so the um, so it it's not t too surprising that R1 has a bigger distance from uh, uh, Q2 than it does to Q1, um, because the human and uh, platypus are more distantly related to than human uh, and whale, but these these values are so big, um, and that and this first value between the human and the platypus is also so much larger from uh, or so much larger than the distance between the chicken and the whale that something seems suspect here. This just doesn't seem right. So the reason for this is that we have assumed here that only substitution events have occurred in these sequences. Um, so over the course of evolutionary history, we're assuming that there were never any insertion deletion events, but only situations where one amino acid was replaced with another. Um, but we know that's not true when we look at Q2, which is an example of a case where we have a sequence that is one amino acid shorter than the others that we've looked at. So what that, uh, what that tells us is that there was probably an insertion or deletion event that happened somewhere. So either one amino acid was deleted from the platypus sequence or one amino acid was inserted in the other three sequences that we've looked at. Um, and so if I start looking at these sequences, so for example, if I print out R1, actually, let me clear first, and then I'll print out R1 and Q2. Um, what I can see is, um, you know, if I were to look at this and try and make a hypothesis about where 
this deletion event happened. Um, it's a little hard to see, and that's you know what we have the algorithms that we're going to study in this uh, next couple weeks for. Um, but if I I spent a little bit of time looking at this before the lecture, and what I noticed is that there is um, an ML at the beginning of this sequence here, and then up here there's an MVL, um, and so I. Um, started wondering if maybe that um, sequence was, or sorry, maybe that second amino acid was deleted. And so I did an experiment. I defined a new sequence, which I called uh, Q2 aligned. And instead of putting that dash character at the end of the sequence now, I put it in that second position. So let me clear my screen again. I'll print out R1 and I'll print out Q2 aligned. Um, and so we can see now, like if we have MVL up here, we have M-L down here, we can see that that does align some other amino acids um, that previously weren't aligned. And so if we scan through this, um, for example, we can see like there's a V at the beginning here, um, so that would be at uh, the 10th position in the sequence. Um, over here, we see there's, um, this is looking more similar, so H-G-E-E. -E. Up here, we have H-A-G-E. Um, over here, we start with E-R, E-R-L-F. Up here, we have E-R-M-F, K-T-Y-F, K-T-Y-F. H-G-S-A, H-G-S-A. And so it looks like we, these are more aligned with one another now. Um, just for comparison, let me print Q2 out again. So that was the unaligned one. Um, and so you can see, like, here I've got VKA. Down here I have TAL. Here I have HAG. Here I have GEE. -E, here I have ERM. Here I have RLF. So these are really different from one another now. Um, so this... Um, Q2 aligned that I defined looks a lot more similar to R1 than it does to, um, than, uh, sorry, than Q2 itself did. So let me clear that. And the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to get the um, hamming distance between R1 and Q2 aligned. Um, and you may have noticed here I typed print before hamming and before I just called hamming. It doesn't really matter so much when we are working in an interactive terminal um, uh, because it'll still just print this out to the screen for me in this case. Um, and so the hamming distances that we see here, so between um, R1 and Q2 aligned, we're getting a hamming distance of about 27%. And between R2 and Q2 aligned, we're getting a hamming distance of about 35%. Um, and so what this tells us is that the platypus is more similar to the human. So again, mammal to mammal has a smaller distance than the platypus is to the chicken. Um, and so, um, so again, this has aligned with our expectations of what, uh, of, or our understanding of the evolutionary relationship between these organisms. Um, so what we did here is we created a pairwise alignment of R1 and Q2 aligned and of R2 and Q2 aligned. And then we computed the hamming distances between them. So when we um, align positions, what we're doing is we are trying to maximize the similarity of a pair of sequences using that dash character to fill in spaces where one character is missing with respect to that location in the other sequences. <clears throat> when we're computing alignments, we refer to that dash character as a gap or a gap character. Um, so if I just wanted to see what these looked like um, aligned with one another, I could say 
print them on top of one another like that. And you'll see that this is, um, again, a, a pretty good alignment that we have between these. When we get a little bit further along, I just said this was a pretty good alignment, we're gonna talk about how we would quantify that. And so we will talk about how you can determine this, this uh, statistical significance of an alignment, for example. Okay, we just took a few minutes to create our first sequence alignment together, but let's now take a minute and talk about what a biological sequence alignment actually is. So over the course of biological evolution, a DNA sequence changes, most frequently due to random errors in replication. The replication errors are referred to as mutations, and three of the most common types that occur are substitution mutations, which is when one DNA base is replaced with another, insertions, when one or more contiguous DNA bases are inserted into a sequence, or deletions, when one or more contiguous DNA bases are deleted from a sequence. Now, this uh, illustration that I have up on this slide shows how this might happen, starting with one ancestral sequence, and that's the one over on the left, diverging into two sequences over on the right. Now, these two sequences are said to be homologs or of one another, or homologous sequences. Um, what that means is that they are thought to have derived from a common ancestral sequence. Now, you can see here that if you compare these um, diverged sequences from the ancestral sequence, there are a few specific places where they differ. Um, and you might even be able to start making some hypotheses about what happened over that course of time that resulted in these two variant sequences. But one challenge that we have is that we typically only have access to the present day sequences. So we don't know what the ancestral sequence was because it may come from an organism who went extinct um, millions or billions of years ago. And so from these present day sequences, we need to make a hypothesis about their, uh, about what evolutionary events happened without having access to that ancestral sequence. And that is really what pairwise sequence alignment is. So the goal of pairwise sequence alignment is given to biological sequences, and those can be DNA, RNA, or protein sequences, your goal is to generate a hypothesis about which sequence positions derived from a common ancestral sequence position. Um, and so again, this might happen with DNA, RNA, or protein sequences, depending on what you have access to and depending on the goals of the experiment. Um, the way that we would typically do this is we would take what's known as a maximum parsimony approach and we would insert gaps to align the sequences to one another. And so in a maximum parsimony approach, we're assuming that the simplest explanation, so the one that involves the fewest or the most common types of mutation events, is the most likely series of events that resulted in these two sequences. Um, and so if we were to take a look at these um, present day sequences um, and generate a few potential alignments of them, we could end up with these three different sequences, or sorry, these three different sequence alignments that we have on the bottom of the screen here. Um, so in the first case, we are um, essentially um, hypothesizing that two um, deletion events may have occurred in that bottom sequence or insertion events have occurred in the top sequence. And then for the other two alignments, we have some different hypotheses. The key here is that there are many possible alignments of these sequences. Um, these are three possibilities. Um, technically, you could probably have an infinite number of these, um, but most of them would be very unreasonable. So like inserting very large numbers of gaps probably doesn't make sense here. Um, but there are a lot of possible alignments. And one of the challenges with 
this um, with this algorithm is figuring out what are the most biologically relevant of the possible alignments. Um, and so you can think of an alignment as a table um, where each where the rows in this table are your sequences and the columns are the positions in those sequences. Um, and so that um, might look like um, something like this. And what each column in that alignment represents is a hypothesis about the evolutionary history of that sequence position. Um, and so in this slide, I annotated what those hypotheses are for the different positions. Um, and so you can see that I'm annotating this first one as having an indel. Um, and what the reason we call that an indel, what I mean by that is that we're hypothesizing that either an insertion event or a deletion event took place. You'll notice here that if we don't have the ancestral sequence, we don't know which of those happened. We know that either a base was inserted or a base was deleted. So to reflect the fact that we don't know which of those events actually occurred, we typically call those indel events. In the second column, I'm hypothesizing that there was no change in that position over the course of evolutionary history. Um, same at the next two positions. Um, then when we get to the fifth position, I'm hypothesizing that there was a substitution event followed by no change, followed by an insertion deletion event, and then two more uh, positions where I hypothesize that there was no change. Um, so the next thing that we'll do is we're going to work through our first algorithm for aligning these sequences to one another computationally. Um, this first one that we work through is a very accessible approach, um, so it's easy for us to compute. And in fact, I will do that um, on my tablet um, just to show you by hand what that looks like. Um, but it's probably a little bit too simplistic. And so for most cases, this is not the approach that we would use. I like to start with this to uh, make it accessible, and then we'll move on to some of the more complex algorithms. Okay, so now I'm gonna, like I said, work through a relatively simple approach for aligning a pair of sequences. <clears throat> so imagine we have the two sequences that I have written down here. Um, these are the ones from the previous example. The way that this algorithm works is you would start by um, defining a matrix that has the top sequence on uh, one axis, and so in other words, like the columns of the matrix, and has the other sequence as the rows of the matrix. Um, the next step is that you would work through this matrix, and you would um, add in like some character to indicate when the character in the row and the column match one another, and when they don't match. And so here, I'm going to say that 1 indicates a match and 0 indicates a mismatch. And so um, pretty simple what I would do here. So I would add a 0, then a 1. And so like the reason I started that is because here A and C are a mismatch and C and C are a match. Um, and so that's why I have a 0 and a 1 there. Um, to score the next match, um, C and C, I would add a 1 there. Um, then I have a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. Moving on to my next row, um, it would actually, since I'm working row by row here, it's actually the same as the previous row because it's a C again. Um, but I'll just work through it. So it's a 0 for a mismatch, 1 for a match, 1 for a match, 0, 0, zero, 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 zero. Um, next row is the first one that's different. So here I would have a one because A and A match one another. Um, then I have zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Um, this next one is gonna be the same again. So, whoops. Um, 
So it'll be one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 and so on. Um, I would encourage you to pause the video and write this down, work through this example for yourself. Um, after you've completed it, you should have a matrix that looks um, something like this. And so this is going to be the matrix that shows where all my matches and my mismatches are. Um, one thing that is handy um, for the next step is if we actually draw a grid here. Um, and so I'm going to draw some lines and then do this going um, vertically as well and we'll use this in the next step and I already have this whole thing completed um, on my next page here um, so at this at this point we have um, scored the uh, matches versus the mismatches and the next step in our alignment process um, is um, what's known as tracing back the alignment um, and so here is where we decide um, what we're going to transcribe. And so um, basically how we're going to create the aligned paired of sequences from this data that we currently, or from this table that we currently have. Um, I just realized I'm missing a couple of lines um, here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add those in. Um, um, and I may have to do that on some other slides that I have in here too. <clears throat> when you trace back your matrix, what you're doing is you're starting at this very bottom position. Um, so um, this position down here, and you're gonna draw a line that goes all the way up to this position up here. And then we'll work through following that line so that we can um, transcribe the alignment. This will make a little bit more sense when I do it. Um, one of the one of the keys here is that um, we uh, well let me let me do this and then I'll explain it in a little bit more detail. I think it'll be more clear that way. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to start drawing a line. And what I want to do is I want to try and hit the positions that mismatch, or sorry, that match as I'm doing that. Um, and so I can see, like when I'm looking at this, that right here, I have a stretch of ones on the diagonal. Right here, I have a stretch of ones on the diagonal. And so what you're really trying to do is figure out how to connect those diagonal stretches of one because as you can tell like that is where we have a string of matches so like um, here's this um, sorry here is this c and c then down here is a c and c here is an a and an a and then we have a mismatch here but here we have a g and a g a t and a t and a t and a t um, and so Initially, as we're thinking about this, you can really go any way that you want here. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line that comes over here and then comes up along this diagonal. Um, and we have to end over here. Um, and so what I've done here is I have traced a line through this matrix. Um, it's more or less, um, like I said, first time, it's pretty arbitrary how you do this. Um, but now that we have this line, um, what we can do is we can figure out how to transcribe the alignment from it. And so starting at the end, um, if we follow that line and it crosses um, just a single vertical line in here. Um, so in other words, if we move um, directly left, um, we are going to, um, I'm gonna use the word consume here. We're gonna consume a character from our horizontal sequence um, or one of our columns, and we're not gonna consume a sequence from our 
uh, row or uh, character from our rows. Um, and so I'm just going to jot that rule down. Um, on the other hand, if we were to move directly up, we would consume a row character, but not a column character. And if we move diagonally, then we consume a row and a column character. Again, I don't assume that this makes a lot of sense yet. So let's start in the bottom. Um, and uh, we're now down in this bottom corner here. And I'm going to follow this line. And the first thing that this line does is it moves directly to the left. Um, and so that means that I'm going to um, like we set up here, um, consume a column character. Um, and so what that means is we are going to write a T down because our the column character that we would be consuming would be the one that corresponds to that column. So we would jot a T down. And then because we're not consuming a row character, we would put a gap character. Uh, in our other um, in our other sequence and so we're going to transcribe the alignment down here on the bottom um, so I've now moved over to this cell and if I follow the line I'm going diagonally and so what that means is that I am going to consume a row character and a column character here and so the next thing that I would jot down would be a T and a T because my column here has a T in it and my row here has a T in it. So I would jot down T and T. <clears throat> I'm now in this cell here. Um, and so if I continue to follow this line diagonally, I'm again going to consume a T from my column and a T from my row. So I'll jot those down. I'm now in this cell here. Um, and so I'll consume a G and a G. Um, I, that puts me in this cell here. Um, you can see I have a mismatch here, but I'm still moving diagonally. Um, and so I have a T in the column and I have an A in the row. And so T, A. Uh, I'm now in this cell. I've got an A and an A. Which puts me in this cell here where I have a C and a C. Which puts me in this cell here. So I've got a C and a C again. So that moves me up here. Um, and so at this point, I don't have anywhere further diagonal I can go, but I still need to get back to this cell over here. And so I'm going to move directly um, to the left. And when I move directly to the left, that means that I consume a column character, but not a row character. And so if I consume that last column character, that will be an A, and I add a dash um, because I'm not consuming a row character in that case. There's no more row characters to consume. And so um, you can see that for every 
step that I take through this matrix. So every time I move from one cell to another, I am adding something to my top sequence and something to my bottom sequence. And that gives me the alignment. That gives me this um, essentially like tabular data that I told you about. Um, and this alignment represents our hypothesis about the evolutionary history of these sequences. Um, and so what we're saying is that we have an indel at this position, um, no change at these three positions, a substitution, no change, and then another indel. Um, so now what I've done here so far is I've shown you a path through this matrix, but we don't necessarily know that it's the best path through this matrix. Um, one way that we could start to think about that is by figuring out, have we covered the longest diagonals in this matrix? Because the longest diagonals are going to be where we expect to see the biggest stretches of no change. Now, if you're following along in the Q2 book material, you'll see that I actually compute the length of the diagonals um, for each one of these. I'm doing it in a slightly different way here just because it's easier on paper um, to just not compute that and just sort of squint at it um, and figure out what's going on. Um, so work through this a little bit by hand um, and then um, move on and look how we're doing it with computer code. You'll see they're related, um, but some things that are easier to do um, by hand um, or some things that are easier to do on the computer, I'm not doing by hand. Um, but let's let's look at one more example, um, just so you can get a little bit more experience with this. Um, and so I am going to um, take another copy of this matrix. And again, I've got to add those two lines that I was forgetting before. Um, and let's just transcribe a totally different alignment here. Um, I guess it won't be totally different. It's the same sequences. Um, but let's just take a different pathway through here. Um, so imagine that this time I'm going to just come up here like this. And so that lets me not have any gaps at the end of the sequence. Um, then I will, let's see, I'll come over here. And then I'll come up. And then I'll go. My drawing program is making some nice straight lines for me sometimes, but not other times. Okay, so imagine that we're now going to take this path through. Um, so I would again start in my bottom cell. Um, actually, I'll copy over those rules that we had before just so you can see them here again. Um, oh, you know what? Um, I don't know if I know how to copy between pages. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so those are my rules. Um, and so I am going to get my pen out again. Um, okay, so now we're again, our goal is to start in this bottom cell and end up in this top cell. And it looks like I copied, a, copied an extra pink line there, but I'm just not gonna worry about that. Um, okay, so um, now I start in this bottom cell and so I move initially diagonally. And so I'm gonna transcribe a T and a T. Um, and so that corresponds to this T up here and this T down here. And I'm moving one cell up. So I'm now in this cell over here. Um, I'm leaving this cell on the diagonal. And so I'm going to again transcribe a T from the column and a T from the row. Um, so now I am in this cell. 
I'm going to move one to the left. And so when I move left, I consume a column character, um, but I'm not consuming a row character. Um, instead of consuming a row character, I put a gap. And so here I've got a T and a gap. Um, and now one thing that is important to point out is at this stage, at this traceback stage, it doesn't quite matter so much in our example algorithm here what the values are in these cells anymore. All that matters is how we're moving um, through this matrix. Um, so like we don't care here that we, we have a zero or a one. That's just something that um, is sort of a holdover from the previous step um where we're trying to look for how to maximize how many of these um, ones we're hitting as we trace back through the matrix um, okay so we are in this cell here um, we just or sorry no we're in this cell here we just moved to the left once we're going to move to the left again which means that we're going to consume this g up here um, and so g and dash because we're moving to the left. Um, so we are now um, over here. We're moving to the left again. So we're gonna consume a T and insert a gap. That'll put us over here. Um, and now we're, we're taking a sharp turn and we're starting to go up. Um, and so what that means is we're going to consume a row character, but not a column character. And so we're going to put a G in our bottom sequence, and we're going to put a gap in our top sequence. So we've got a gap, and we've got a G. We're now here. We're going up again. So we're going to put an A in our bottom sequence, and a gap in our top sequence. Um, and now we are in this cell um, and we are now moving diagonal. And so now again, we're finally not transcribing a gap, but um, transcribing a match. And so we have an A and an A. Um, so we're here, we now have a C and a C. Um, so we have moved up here. We have another C. Uh, we have another C and C. So we're going to move up here. Uh, and then we are moving one to the left. Um, and so that's the same way we ended last time, where we consume an A and we add a gap character to our other sequence. Um, and so you can see now we have a different alignment of these sequences. Um, and at this stage, we don't really know yet. Um, we don't really have a way to say yet which of these is perhaps a better alignment and which of these uh, might be a worse alignment. I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture or a little earlier in the lecture that we often are taking a maximum parsimony approach when we are trying to evaluate alignments. Um, and so what that typically means is that we would assume that the alignment that has the f that uh, implies the fewest number of mutation events would be the more likely alignment or the um, or the higher quality alignment. That is not always going to be the case, but it's a place to start in terms of scoring alignments, and uh, scoring alignments helps us to compare alignments. Um, and so I'm just going to um, propose a really simple scoring scheme here. Um, and with this scoring scheme, what we're going to say is that um, anytime two characters match, we will add um, one to the score. And anytime we have a mismatch, we will subtract one from the score. Um, and so if we were to um, say, just uh, tally all these up, the way that would work is we would have minus one,
And so if I were to add these up, um, I would have, let me see. So I've got um, negative one, zero, one, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, uh, negative two, negative one. And so the score for this alignment, based on this simple scoring scheme that we just came up with, would be negative one. Now let's go back and score our previous alignment with this. So here we would have negative one plus one, Oops, that would be a, this would be a negative one, plus one, plus one. And so if we add this one up, we have one, two, oh, sorry, I've got an error there. That would be a negative one. Um, and so we would have a score of four for this alignment. And so if we were to compare these two scores, what this would suggest to us is based on this scoring scheme, that this first alignment is a better alignment than the other one. It implies um, fewer mutation events. And you can see that when you're looking at this. So as we said before, um, you know, so this would be a mutation event, this would be a mutation event, this would be a mutation event. So just three mutation events here. Um, this one is a little bit trickier, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna say this would be one, this would be one, this would be one. And so we've got five mutation events, depending on how we think about um, these events here. Um, and so, that aligns with this like maximum parsimony idea where the simplest alignment, the one with the fewest mutation events would be this first one. And so we might assume that this is a better alignment of the sequences than the second one that we came up with. Okay, so I mentioned when I was getting started that this algorithm that I was introducing was accessible but overly simplistic. Um, and so now I just want to wrap up by talking about a couple of the reasons why this is overly simplistic, and that will lead us to some of the things that we're going to do in the next couple of lectures. Um, the first thing is that we're scoring all of the matches as one and all of the mismatches as negative one. Um, and so this suggests that all matches are equally likely and all mismatches are equally unlikely. Um, and remember that there are two different types of mutation events at play here. There are substitution events and there are um, insertion deletion events. Um, and based on what you know about protein coding um, regions of DNA, you can probably assume that um, insertion deletion events might often be um, more problematic than a substitution event. And so if you delete, for example, one base or two bases from a uh, protein coding region of a DNA sequence, you could end up with what's known as a frame shift mutation. Um, that would be a situation where um, all of the amino acids downstream of that mutation are potentially changed because you have disrupted the, um, the codons in that message. And so an insertion deletion event could potentially be um, a lot more problematic than a, than a substitution event. Um, and so we might want to think about scoring those differently um, from one another. When we get into um, aligning protein sequences, this idea of scoring all matches as one and all mismatches as negative one, or in other words, um, all matches being equally likely, um, also doesn't make so much sense because we know that some amino acids are chemically more similar to one another than others. And so, for example, a mutation that resulted in a glycine being replaced with, say, a, um, a leucine would be um, a relatively um, lower impact mutation than, say, a glycine being replaced with glutamic acid um, when you might be getting um, going from an uncharged to a charged amino acid. 
Um, and so when we start talking about protein alignments, we'll talk about how we can um, differentially score matches and mismatches. Um, one of the other issues with, um, with this scoring scheme that we applied here and this um, approach as a whole is that we scored um, every new gap the same as every extended gap. And so if we have a single dash character, we would um, apply the same penalty as if we had three dashes in a row. And so like the three dashes in a row might be scored as negative three. Um, so each one has the same type of penalty. When we look at, um, well, another um, way to think about this is that maybe um, we should score the start of a gap event or a, an insertion deletion event differently than the length of that insertion deletion event. Um, and so maybe you get a, um, a, more, a bigger negative score, so like maybe a negative five when you introduce a new gap, but then each base that you extend it by um, maybe incurs a smaller penalty. The reason for that is because these um, insertion deletion events um, uh, don't happen on a per base level. Um, an insertion or a deletion might occur and then you might lose multiple bases as a result. Um, and so just some complexities in how we need to think about the scoring. Um, but any scoring scheme that we use is going to have some limitations, and you should always remember that when you're working with these. Um, for example, if you're using a system like BLAST, there's going to be some scoring system behind the scenes that may or may not make a lot of sense for the data that you're working with. It's easy to forget that sometimes and just accept that the computer is giving you the right answer. Um, you as a bioinformatician need to understand what the computer is doing so that you can determine whether you agree with the result that a system is giving you or whether you disagree with the result that a system is giving you. Um, algorithms like this one that we just explored for doing sequence alignment are here to help you do your work, but they're not gonna do the work for you. You should always be skeptical of these types of automated approaches to solve complex problems. We need them, there's no doubt about that, but you should think of them as helping you come to an answer rather than giving you an answer. Um, another thing that you have to think about when you're looking at these types of algorithms is how long they're gonna to take to run. Um, that's also known as the computational complexity of the algorithm. When we search a sequence against a database, um, for example, so something like BLAST, um, you might be searching against billions and billions of bases, which would correspond with this algorithm that we just looked at to billions of columns in one of those matrices. Um, so computers are fast, but the data sets that you're going to be working with are very large, um, and in many cases they're growing larger over time very quickly. Um, so you inevitably are going to discover the limitations of some of the algorithms and some of the software that you're using. And so you're going to have to think about how long these things are going to take to run and how much memory they're going to take to run. We'll be coming back to this um, later in um, this series of lectures. Um, so over the next few lectures, we are going to start talking about different ways to address these issues and talking about some of the actual line or some of the uh, actual algorithms that people are using in practice to do pairwise sequence alignment. Um, we'll also start to look at the computational complexity of pairwise sequence alignment at the end of that chapter and um, later uh, at, uh, later on, we're going to explore some um, approaches for addressing that. All right, I will see you next time.